great. And great. <laughs> I'll just do then my intro. Intros are so awkward every time I'll die a little inside. Every time I have to do an intro, a fucking hawk looks of me dies. Anyways. Hey everyone, welcome to today's video. And I have a very special guest with me, your local Aruna, the Dutch folk witch. And I'm very happy that I have her here today to do a little interview with me, similar to what I already did with a hearth witch. So do you want to introduce yourself first? Uh, yes, of course. I'm uh, your local Aruna on TikTok. And um, I practice Dutch folk magic, like you said. And I've been doing this for uh, this particular path for about three years now. And uh, overall spirituality and witchcraft for about eight years now. All right. And so to kind of start us off, I always like to um, ask people, how um, they kind of started within their own practice and how they found uh, the practice that they follow today. So what's kind of the background story there for you? Uh, for me, it started uh, with crystals. My sister and I uh, collected crystals since I was very young. And uh, we did kind of believe in the powers that they're usually ascribed to, to but we didn't really recognize it as a belief. It was just this thing that we did. Um, then after that, it went on a bit of a hold. And then when I was about 13, I think, I went on an exchange with my school to Cambridge. And the girl I stayed with had a tarot deck. And that got me really interested in divination. So when I got home, uh, I researched it and I found the term Book of Shadows. And I started one, even though I didn't really know what I was doing. And I did a lot of divination with like playing cards and like, uh, what a lot of beginner witches did um, back in the day makes me sound so old, but like before we had this huge community on TikTok and Tumblr, uh, you kind of had to like work it out for yourself. So I was doing a lot of divination with playing cards and then getting the meaning from numerology that I found on a sketchy website, you know. <laughs> and at one point I found a divination deck um, and I found it on the, at a flea market. And like when my mother wasn't looking, I like sneakily bought it. So that's like kind of where it started. And like I said, there wasn't really that big of a community yet, or I just hadn't found it yet. Uh, but when I slowly started working with gods and getting into paganism, I did find Tumblr because the Lokians had a bit of a community, like a small community on Tumblr already. And that's kind of how I found the community and then it grew bigger and bigger. And uh, well, now I'm kind of here. <laughs> and Dutch folk magic is something that I got into uh, pretty late. I didn't really realize that certain countries had their own folk magic, had their own practices. Uh, I think a lot of people can relate when you start with spirituality, especially on the internet, everything seems like it's a monolith everything seems like it's very like a generalized thing like you have to know your chakras your crystals <laughs> you have to know yoga like uh it's a lot of new age stuff and uh at one point i realized like oh wait maybe this is also like a country thing a, a folk magic thing and on tumblr i found one person who posted one spell one old dutch folk spell and that got me like into my deep dive on Dutch folk magic. So I immediately DM them like, do you have any sources for me so I can get started on this? And they gave me a few sources and then it just went crazy after that. Uh, that's great. Uh, so I had kind of um, sort of uh, similar experiences where um, uh, I knew that kind of like folk magic existed as a child, but I didn't recognize it as folk magic, which I think is the experience for a lot of us. And um, then later when I already went in a bit down this like new agey witchy path, I kind of discovered that uh, German folk magic was a thing. And then I kind of reconnected the dots to my childhood and I was like, wait a minute. <laughs> so 
Um, yeah, there's a lot of things that my Catholic mom also does that is like so obviously folk magic. Yeah. Uh, she she taught me to do uh, love divination with apples, like throwing the peel when you peel it whole, like throwing it over your shoulder, see what letter it turns into, uh, throwing apple seeds at your door to see which direction your next love uh, is in. And it's... <laughs> Yeah, that sort of stuff, she does that, but she doesn't really recognize it as folk magic, as I think a lot of folk practitioners don't really recognize what they're doing. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So when you um, talk about folk magic, uh, Dutch folk magic in particular, I always see like um, the very strong similarities between German folk magic. And I wanted to ask you, are there like any generalizations that you could maybe make about Dutch folk magic, although it's probably also pretty diverse within Dutch regions. Yeah, that's the thing. Like, on the one hand, you can generalize because uh, today Dutch people are very much um, kind of like the same person. <laughs> like, I, I don't want to generalize like entirely because if you go to the north or you go to the south, you will meet different different kind of people. But they all have this. Uh, I don't give a fuck energy and fuck around and find out energy. <laughs> like we're, we're all pretty blunt, pretty straightforward. So that is also reflected in a lot of the folk magic. Um, one spell that is one of my favorites is uh, not like you have very ceremonial big spells. Like you have to do specific instructions. Uh, at a specific time of day, um, at a specific time of the week. But you also have the spells like uh, chalking on your door, hey fever, please don't go into my house, please go away, please go away. And that is just the, the bluntness and the simpleness of, if it works, it works, <laughs> and we don't care, I don't give a fuck, you know, that kind of thing. I think that is pretty, um, pretty much everywhere in the Netherlands. But you do see uh, differences in, for example, uh, Frisia or the lower Saxon regions that you also know about, like, uh, was that Groningen and Drenthe, Drenthe, I think? Yeah, so that is also um, even small villages, like the village I'm from, they have their own celebrations, their own folk celebrations. Um, I got from out Berland, which is pretty close to Rotterdam. So that is a lot of sea things, sea shanties, uh, <laughs> um, the, the sea market, uh, the harbor market every year. And uh, when I moved to Harlem and uh, moved close to the Veluwe, it changed because uh, Harlem has a lot of um, city-like things, but it's also pretty old. So you have a lot of uh, rural and, and ghost stories and that sort of stuff. And now I live near the Veluwe and that's a lot of forest. So that's like where you are in the Netherlands does kind of matter, I think, for your practice. But it's also you can kind of generalize about it because there's also um, certain spells will have different variations across the country, but they will also sound kind of similar. And I think that is also a connection between Dutch folk magic and German folk magic. I think I saw a German folk spell once that sounded really uh, like a Dutch folk spell. It was about, um, it went like uh, you had a mountain and you walk up the mountain and you see three women and one woman says this and the other woman says this and, uh, and then the spell is done. And that is a structure that um, appears all around the Netherlands from north to south, but it always like changes a bit, like the one woman says a different thing than in the other spell. But I also saw this in a German spell, and I thought that was really interesting that the structures uh, were so similar. Yeah, absolutely. So that's what um, I meant when I said that I kind of recognized stuff from German folk magic when you talk about Dutch folk magic. And I think, I mean, that makes sense. I mean, Dutch and German people are related in yeah. their language and culture. But um, I uh, thought, um, for example, when we talk about um, cultural nuances and minority languages, for example, um, we have Low Saxon here in Germany and you have uh, Nedersachsisch in um, the Netherlands. 
And uh, what happened, for example, after the Second World War is that the Dutch Low Saxon speakers kind of didn't want anything um, to do with German Low Saxon speakers. And then these kind, kinds of groups diverged. And I thought to myself, if this might be similar in um, folk magic or uh, cultural folk practices that uh, they also kind of separated from the Dutch side when the Dutch people did not want to do anything, not, not want to have anything to do with Germans. Can you see yeah. that? Or? Yeah, and I think it's also because um, the Dutch and uh, the nether Saxon regions didn't always see eye to eye is like <laughs> not even the right term for this um they uh, the the netherlands holland i think uh i heard about a lot of kind of oppression that they weren't allowed to speak nether saxon in schools and um i think frisian uh people from frisia had the same thing that they weren't allowed to speak their own language because uh they want people to speak what we call ABN, which is um, correct Dutch. And uh, yeah, I think that even though there's a lot of a connection between the uh, provinces now, and you can kind of see Netherlands as one thing, we still feel that um, disconnect. Like we still see the Frisians as uh, pretty uh, resisting people <laughs> i don't know the right term i can't think of the right term but i think you know what i mean like the freedom fighters you know and um we still in in the south and in um well in the west west uh we uh, make fun of the accents in uh drenthe and groningen um because a lot of people here think it's just weird yeah um, i've so talked there is this big thing of the Netherlands, but there's still this disconnect and this 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 distance between them. Yeah, I've talked um, to uh, the woman who runs the website. I, I don't know how to pronounce it because I don't know any, any Dutch, yes, but I think you know this Eigenbodem? website. Hmm? Goden van Eigenbodem? Yes, exactly. <laughs> I've uh, talked to her and uh, she said that um, the uh, the way that people in Twente speak is kind of considered like the country bumpkin accent, like they that they are kind of dumb and stuff like that. And, and that really um, reminded me of how people here speak about low Saxon speakers. And they kind of think that they are too stupid to understand the standard language. And what I found also pretty interesting that on um, the same side, uh, their uh, language and stuff was kind of viewed as savage, brutish, and stupid, but also their like folk culture was viewed as kind of um, interesting and was romanticized in a way, especially during the turn of uh, the century from 18th, uh, from 19th to 20th century, uh, where uh, some people kind of suddenly got interested in what the northerners had to say and um, kind of went into the villages and recorded a bunch of folk rituals and stuff like that. So I think that there is also like a big parallel with the Netherlands because I think something similar happened in your country. Yes, um, they often see the Northerners as like the stupid farmer stereotype, like uh, kind of how Americans sometimes make fun of the Texan accent, like howdy, <laughs> that sort of stuff. That is kind of how we also how I say we, I don't see them like that, but uh, how the Westerners often see the Northerners uh, as kind of like the stupid farmers, they don't know what they're talking about. But at the same time, uh, they have this, indeed this fascination for folklore and this I, honestly kind of scary um, fascination with nationality and that sometimes goes too far, especially I think you know about the Black Pete debate um which is based off a stereotype of course and uh the thing is that um this is also a tradition technically it's about 200 years old so it's not that that old uh name black pete goes back further and the figure goes back further but the uh, look and the stereotype and the blackface goes back only like about 200 years 
but they still hold on to this tradition as if it's the only thing that we have left, even though we have a lot of other traditions. We have klompedans, we have uh, tracht, klederdracht, um, we have uh, folk music, and all, all those things, th these are beautiful things about our culture, but for some reason, the Dutch are like, no, this is tradition, this is tradition. They're, it's, they only want to fight for that one piece of tradition. And when you ask like, oh, where are your klompe then? Where are your wood shoes? And then they like shut down because that's stupid. That is yeah. for farmers. That is like, no, no one does that. That's for old people. But when it comes to black beet, it's suddenly it's tradition. We need to take it back. I think, yeah, <laughs> there, there's a lot of, um, yeah, nuance in that conversation. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. So I wanted to kind of um, circle back to the um, uh, Netherlands, Germany uh, conversation, because I think you work with Frau Holle, right? Yes, yes, I do. And um, as far as I'm aware, I might be wrong, there's no folklore of Frau Holle specifically in the Netherlands. I think her the folklore where she's uh, mentioned as Frau Holle only exists in like a mountain range in central Germany. I know that there are Frau Holle like folkloric figures in the Netherlands, but I wanted to kind of know what led you to um, work with specifically Frau Holle where you live. Okay, so Frau Holle, indeed with her name being Frau Holle, uh, is mostly a German figure, but like you said, there's a lot of figures that um, make it seem like she also was a prominent figure in the Netherlands, but they were just more successful with um, changing her into something else. Like in Germany, I think she is often depicted as the child eating, belly slithing demoness, you know, um, or the fairy tale figure, of course. And here you see, for example, in Frisia, they had a figure, I think it was Frisia. Uh, they had a figure that went with Saint Nicholas on the 5th of December, which is also like 5th and 6th of December is one of the dates that Frau Holle uh, <laughs> goes around. And uh, Saint Nicholas there had a companion, a woman companion, a female companion uh, called Saint Lezai, which is connected to Saint Lucy, I think. And then Saint Lucy was also uh, probably synchronized with Frau Holle. Probably, I think. <laughs> this is like research I did a long time ago, so I'm trying to like gather my thoughts. Um, in the south, of, uh, in Limburg, I think you have uh, Saint Barbara, Saint Burp, Saint Berp. I don't know how they pronounce it. I, I'm, I don't speak Limburg. Um, but she was also a companion to Saint Nicholas uh, on the 5th and the 6th, and then she had her own um, day later on, I think, in December. But they, they have a lot of these things like uh, the wife of St. Nicholas, the wife of St. Nicholas. And I think there is a connection there with Frau Holle as well. I also have a book. I haven't read it completely yet. It's called, uh, I see it now in my bookcase, it's called Friese Volksgebruiken in Weerspiegeld in Europese Folklore. It's um, Frisian folklore reflected in European folklore. And uh, that book talks a lot about uh, signs that Frau Holle was also a prevalent figure in Frisia. Like uh, things we have, like um, the speculaas. I don't know if you know speculaas, it's the spice cookie. Yeah. Um, we make that with like these large wooden planks with figures in it and then we roll it out and then you have this like giant doll. And they had a lot of um, female dolls with like uh, spinning wheels, holding spinning wheels and that sort of stuff. And a lot of uh, scientists, scientists, researchers made the connection with her and Frau Holle. But um, there's a lot of signs that she was also a figure here. Um, some people think that the name Holland is also connected to Holle. However, a lot of uh, etymologists have said that it comes from a word that means like wood because they were wood choppers, wood traders, I think. But uh, there's a lot of things that are left here that are very much, I think, connected to Frau Holle. There's also this creature 
uh, schele geurte, I think it was. Or another creature, but uh, it's, um, it's uh, a, a witte wief. I don't know, the white ladies, the, the, the yeah. uh, ladies in white. And she sits by a uh, mountain and that mountain opens on, I think it was Epiphany, which is also one of the days that is associated with the whole of the 6th of January. And uh, after the 12 days, like she opens the mountain on Epiphany and there's a lot of treasure in there, but you can only take some. You can not take everything. You can't be too greedy because she will hold you there. She will keep you there. But if you only take one, she'll be like giving and she, you can take it. And that to me also sounds like because caves and like the underworld thing is very much connected to her. And then um, also on one of her dates, that sort of thing that is still left in folklore, but that has this filter over it of years and years of changes and uh, probably also Christianity changing it. And I feel like those are remnants of her in this country. So that's super interesting. I did not uh, know about um, like uh, Santa Claus's like female companion and stuff. Uh, in my region, we have um, like, um, St. Nick and uh, then uh, Knecht Ruprecht. Um, but it used to be at least here that um, like Knecht Ruprecht um, is like uh, the punisher, kind of like Krampus. Uh, it used to be in my region that uh, St. Nick and Knecht Ruprecht were kind of the same figure uh, called uh, Suna Klaus in Low Saxon. And that was just the one single figure. So uh, I kind of really wish that we also would have like this female companion because there's not a lot of like Frau Holle-esque folklore here. I mean, the closest that we have would maybe be the Witte Wieven. Um, I think the name is like exactly the same as in Dutch. <laughs> and uh, yeah, these are like um, spooky female ghost figures that kind of roam around at the night, uh, in the night. And that's almost like everything we have. So I think in some ways, it would maybe make even more sense for you to work with Frau Holle than with than me, for example. We don't have much folklore about her in the Northwest. As I said, it's mostly in the mountains. What we have here, though, are like um, strong, almost pagan-like uh, female saints. Um, for example, in my village, we have uh, Saint Anne, which is the mother of uh, Mary. And we have like this uh, wooden statue of her that has a legend attached to it um, that she was found in, in an old oak that was chopped down and the statue was then brought out and lots of other stuff. And yeah. uh, the end of the story basically is that we uh, each year on, uh, I think the Assumption of Mary, take that statue and go with it around like the fields to uh, bless them for the coming year. That sounds a lot like the ritual that they did for Nurthus that they probably Yes, yes, exactly. Like That's what I think. Follow around on the cart uh, to yeah. give fertility and then like put her in the lake. <laughs> yeah. Oh, well, we don't put the wow. statue in the lake. I think it wouldn't survive. Uh, but um, yeah, that's, for example, a thing that I uh, thought about um, with uh, terms of like synchronization. Like my thought process is, was there maybe once a strong female land deity here that was then syncretized with Saint Anne? And this is also where like, folk Catholicism plays into my practice and I think it also plays into yours as well. So what is your perspective on that? Um, I think that at the moment, like right now, it is almost impossible to separate folk magic and Catholic folk practice. Um, they are very much intertwined and uh, there are rumors that a lot of uh, rituals, a lot of um, spells, that sort of stuff, uh, go back to pagan times, but that isn't as much proven as we would want it to be. That isn't as sure as we would want it to be. So the Christian, the Catholic aspect, aspect is just a large part of the folk magic. And I think also because it's so ingrained in your society, you can't really practice folk magic without that aspect yeah so um when you call on um like 
saints, for example, do you have like a pagan deity also mind that was maybe syncretized with that saint or that you syncretize with that saint in your own UPG? Or do you actually call on the, in quotes, pure Catholic entity of that saint? The thing is, I don't call on a lot of saints. Mm -hmm. I uh, mainly call on Mary Magdalene and Saint Anthony. Mary Magdalene, because I feel a personal connection to her. My second name is also Mary, probably Mary the mother, but I still feel that connection. Um, but uh, also Saint Anthony, because he was in my family. Um, my grandmother called to him. Her uh, mother was like a big Anthony fan. I think a lot of people in folk magic uh, yeah. called to Saint Anthony because he's, he's a quick responder. <laughs> But um, I, I'm not aware of any deities in my practice, definitely not, but even outside my practice that are syncretized with Saint Anthony. It's very much possible. I don't know everything. But um, when I call on Saint Anthony, I do call on specifically Saint Anthony and not uh, a syncretized version of him. But I do think I have a different perspective on Catholicism and Christianity than most other pagans do uh, and other folk practitioners. I, uh, I am kind of like an, I think you call it an omnist. Mm. I, I'm not sure. Um, but I do believe that uh, Jehovah does at, in some capacity exists just like any other God. Uh, he goes way back uh, to times of pantheons, like the Canaanites, I think it was, uh, he was part of a pantheon. So I do think that he exists and that the people who are like made holy under him are just as valid as like people who say that they're priests of Hecate or something, you know? So I do think there is a power there that can be used in folk magic and not just because it has links to paganism, but also because it's powerful in its own right. That's not to say that I am myself a Catholic. I was raised Catholic, but um, I, at first I was kind of angry about that, um, but I have made peace with it. And now I see like there is uh, power in both of them and they don't have to be mu mutually exclusive. Uh, I think it was Hexmarine like not too long ago on TikTok, she made a video about uh, paganism and Christianity being uh, practiced at the same time uh, in a song or a poem about Christmas. And one woman in the poem was uh, praying to God and the other woman in the poem was praying to uh, Frau Bertha. So I think that there is this overlap that you can definitely use, even though a lot of pagans won't agree with you, a lot of folk practitioners won't agree with you, and definitely a lot of Christians won't agree with you. Um, yeah, so <laughs> I don't know what else to say about that. There's just yeah. something very specific, I think, to my practice. Yeah, but I honestly um, can relate to a lot of that. I mean, I also think that like Christianity on its own has value and power in it. I think that the Christian God is real. And if you are Christian and pray to Jesus, for example, um, that you can get results out of that. I think that's completely valid. But yes. also as like folk practitioners who kind of aren't quite Christian and aren't quite pagan, we always walk this like fine line and no one's really happy with us no matter what we do. So. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> Which might also explain why um, historically a lot of uh, folk practitioners just kept quiet about what they do. Yeah. Which is oftentimes pretty infuriating if you want to find out what they did exactly. It makes finding resources sometimes a bit tricky. So I um, wanted, wanted to ask you um, when you went down the rabbit hole of Dutch folk magic and kind of researched everything and also maybe try to do more regional research within the Netherlands. What kind of resources did you use and what kind of ways did you develop for yourself to kind of go about your research? Well, I started very general, like uh, the Netherlands is a small country. So uh, I was like, if there's any sources at all, 
they're not going to be about a certain region. They're first going to be about the whole country. So I was uh, Googling and I was Googling like any search term I could think of Dutch folklore, Dutch folk magic, Dutch folk practices, uh, then everything. Uh, but in Dutch, the <laughs> Netherlands of folks, um, superstitions, even um, Catholic magic, Christian magic. I was uh, looking at basically everything I could get my grubby little hands on. And um, when I found a good source, I would also look in the bibliography and then see where they got their information from, if there's any interesting sources that I could use, that I could read, and then go to their bibliography and then so on and so forth. I must say, I've also had the privilege of um, doing religious studies uh, at uni, a university. Uh, and that gave me the opportunity to um, not only research within this field, so um, I had a lot of teachers, a lot of professors who could help me, but I also had the resources because of the library that uh, I couldn't have had without it. And that gave me a, a big privilege in this case, because there's only so many um, coherent sources on like general Dutch folk practices. And uh, one of them, for example, is very expensive when you find it uh, online, if you even find it online, because it hasn't been reprinted again yet. So there's like maybe, if you're lucky, one copy that you can buy for a lot of money. But um, my library had that. And it was just pages and pages of folk spells and more folk spells and more folk spells. And that really got me going. That really um, made my practice what it is today. So if I didn't have that library, if I didn't have that privilege of going to university, I wouldn't be where I am right now. Uh, then, yeah, it's kind of it's kind of just doing and getting everything that you can get your hands on. So um, even because I there is a website going around also about Dutch goddesses, which is a little less to do with folk magic and a little more to do with paganism, but uh, about goddesses that were um, worshipped in the Netherlands. And uh, that website, I think, when I looked at it first, I was like, oh, this is interesting, all the pages about the goddesses. And the more I read and when I came back to the website, uh, the more I noticed that there were mistakes or uh, assumptions or like the, the, the kind of new age spirituality, uh, spirituality seeping in through the cracks and a lot of assumptions that were made that you couldn't really back up with anything. But it was a really good beginner source to get me started. So I also, I always feel like when people ask me for resources, I do still give those websites because even though they're not 100% correct, they first of all get you started. Second of all, some information is correct. And if you're really interested in what you're doing, you'll go and find out more sources and then you're like, oh, but this doesn't like, this isn't the same information. This is different information. Maybe this is more correct because this writer, this person probably knows more about the subject. Uh, it's not easy, especially if you're not a Dutch speaker. Uh, I recently made a video that I said that Dutch folk, folk magic is open for everyone, uh, regardless of if you have any heritage here or not. A lot of the comments didn't agree with me, <laughs> uh, but I agree with me and I'm one of like three folk practitioners in the Netherlands. So I get to decide, no, just kidding. But um, a lot of people didn't agree with me and uh, I don't, exactly know why because if people really really don't want to put in the effort they won't find anything anyways so even if you're a dutch american and you're trying to reconnect to your roots there's only so many english sources and only so many websites you can translate until you hit a wall and you can't go any further without uh either learning dutch or getting someone who knows Dutch to translate everything for you, which is going to be probably even harder than just learning the language. 
So there is that barrier there, and that is not to keep people out. It's more that there's not enough people interested within the Netherlands to make it more accessible. Um, you brought up some really interesting points. Also the uh, discussion with like European diaspora all around the world who are trying to connect back. Um, I see, I'm gonna sound so shady when I say this, but um, I see a lot of um, German Americans specifically <sighs> being very like gullible in a way um, where they just uh, use these websites that you also talked about, which uh, are kind of like new age inspired and um, not really backed up by anything substantial. And they just see that and run with it. And this is also where a lot of misinformation can come from, especially if those people then spread that information. And then yeah. that is the hear... biggest problem. Yeah. Because if they just use it for their own practice, that is their journey. And they'll probably end up somewhere else with their journey. But if they spread it, it's it becomes a problem. <laughs> yeah. I um I have beef with the uh, American Urglave movement, um, which is like um, the religious pagan reconstruction movement of the Pennsylvania Dutch, um, which is like a group of Germans which migrated from southwestern German. And in America, there they were just called Dutch because I guess English speakers don't know how to properly differentiate Dutch and Deutsch. Anyways. Oh, the Urglave. Yes. Yes. Okay. So sorry, I didn't hear you. I, I I always pronounce it differently because I only saw the word like written. So I, I was like, yeah. oh, wait, what? Well, where's oh, the Urglava? Okay. Yeah. I, yeah. I'm with you. I'm sorry. So <laughs> Urglava is also like a, a, a dialect word and like a Southwest German dialect. So I might be also pronouncing it wrong. I don't know. I'm in the <laughs> North. I have no clue. Anyway, in this movement in the US, um, these Pennsylvania Dutch people are people who um, descend from the US American Pennsylvania Dutch, um, take a lot of parts of German folklore, especially Frau Berchter and Frau Holle. And then they say, these two figures, which are kind of similar, are sisters. Our sisters, when yeah. In reality, there's not a single piece of folklore which mentions Frau Holle and Frau Berchter next to each other and as sisters. Like they're from two different regions. Frau Holle is from central Germany. Frau Berchter is from southern Germany and like the Alpine regions. And these two regions might as well be separate countries because yeah. um, you wouldn't like, these are kind of different cultures and you wouldn't like say that Isis is the sister of Aphrodite, for example. <laughs> oh, and it's kind yeah. of like uh, the similar concept and they, um, think that that's information that they spread about them being sisters is correct and um, that there is somehow like ancient folklore which backs that up which there isn't and they just run with that information and that can get really fast frustrating. I think this and is one of the first things we talked about because I asked you mm. uh, when we just became mutuals yeah. uh, because I was researching Frau Holle and I saw like Frau Holle and Frau Bertha as like a coin and then two sides of the same coin. You can worship one of the sides, you can worship the entire coin, it doesn't matter. But um, I saw a lot of information indeed about them being sisters and I felt really like invalid in my belief that they weren't, that they were kind of like the same, different facets of the same aspect, uh, of the same archetype, I think maybe even. And that's, I think, one of the first thing I asked you about, like, what are your opinions on this? Because I'm confused right now. <laughs> yeah, so um, they probably have a similar root origin, but yeah. um, they were, like, interpreted differently by different cultures. Like, the culture in central Germany interpreted them, uh, that figure as Frau Holle later, and in southern Germany, it became Frau Berchter. Yeah, and you see a, a lot of... Uh, crone or hag figures around winter all around Europe. You have uh, La Benfana, I think, in Italy. Mm -hmm. You have the Kaliach in uh, Scotland. <laughs> Scotland. <laughs> in Scotland. And um, like Frau Perta, Frau Holle, you have the, very much these different figures, but to call them all the same sounds just really wrong to me. Um, yeah. Like I said, it's like 
well, it's like more than a coin because it has more sides. It's like kind of like this candle. Like you have all these different sides. You can call them one candle, but this side is still this side. You know, this side's not the same as this side. Yeah. And I think that there's this this misunderstanding um, when it comes to the diaspora in America. Uh, at one, they kind of want to connect to something, and I completely understand that. But they also miss a lot of cultural context like uh they would see that phenomena of the, that archetype and probably run with it like they do with Frau Berchte and Frau Holle which is as long as they believe that and they are happy with that that is fine but it's also um changing something that isn't really theirs I think <laughs> Yeah, there are also <laughs> it also makes me kind of sound like an asshole. But <laughs> yeah. What they're doing is also sometimes they will just make up folklore. The Pennsylvania Dutch have this folklore um, that for Holle kind of helped them to get started in the US, which to me kind of sounds like manifest destiny, but whatever. And uh, <laughs> but whatever. <laughs> um, Sorry, and, keep going. And um, that folklore is like. I mean, every folklore is made up, but that folklore is like artificially constructed with intention. It did not grow naturally out of the community. It was specifically produced by the Urglave movement to have kind of this narrative, which links them back to Germany in not a Christian way, but more of a pagan way. And yeah. I think that is when we see a lot of like issues pop up between the diaspora and the uh, original culture that the diaspora often feels they have like this right to kind of twist the folklore and their own concept and I wanted to ask you I know this um, happens from the German folk magic perspective but have you seen this which with like the Dutch diaspora as well? I am not aware of a big community uh of a Dutch diaspora in America. I know there's a lot of Dutch people there, but we don't, I think, have anything like Pennsylvania Dutch where they have their own uh, folk magic practices, um, like Blaugerai and stuff. Um, I think that uh, the people that I come across on TikTok that are just very interested in reconnecting to their roots are always very respectful. They just want to learn and they're really interested. They want sources, they want everything. And I do feel like for for me as a European, it's very easy to bash on Americans. <laughs> like we almost do nothing different, <laughs> nothing else. But um, I think it's also a lot of Americans, we have this stereotype of the dumb American and the appropriating American and they uh, do a 23andMe test or my heritage test and they get 1% Dutch and they say like, oh, I am a Dutch folk witch now. But a lot of people in the witch community and the um, folk magic community, I don't feel like they do that. They are genuinely interested. And I do think that we hold the stereotype a bit too close to ourselves. Like when someone who is American, who has like a Dutch grandma or Dutch grandpa is interested in learning this, um, a lot of Dutch people, and if you're Italian or German or a lot of other European people, will be like, "Why do you, why why do you want this? Your grandpa was Dutch, but you're American, so go find your roots there." And when they try to um, do something in their own surroundings, they find that a lot of things are native practices and close to native things um, to indigenous peoples. So. Uh, for example, what Hartwich said in a previous interview that she wanted to use a certain herb, uh, I thought it was marine grass, I think it was mm -hmm. called. Uh, I think that's Lief about Frauen Betstro in Dutch. Um, Woodruff, I don't know. Is that the same thing? I don't know. But she wanted to use that, but in uh, her surroundings, that was also called sweet grass and it was used by the natives. And because it's their land, they have. Uh, first right, I think, to that sort of herb. So they, the Americans, if they are truly interested in 
pursuing something like this folk magic or uh, any sort of um, like not ceremonial magic, but just uh, magic with things that are around you or uh, are in your roots, then they are trying to look in their surroundings and they can't find anything that's their own. And then they try to find it in their heritage. And the people from the country that they find their heritage in are not exactly welcome. And they're just like, oh, that's dumb American, you know. And I think that to a certain extent that does happen. Like people will be like, oh, I am Dutch. I am Dutch. And you're like, oh, really? Uh, what, what does this mean? What does that mean? And they're like, I don't know. <laughs> Do you know what Oli Boy is? No, I don't know that. <laughs> How can you be Dutch then? <laughs> <You know? laughs> but um, there's this, this confusion between, I think, um, bloodlines and culture. Like there's this, this slippery slope to almost blood quantum theories. Like when are you really Dutch? How much American must be in your blood to not be Dutch anymore? Because if your mother or father is Dutch, and you were born in America, then I feel I feel like you're justified in finding your Dutch roots. If your grandpa and grandma are Dutch, then I still feel like you're justified in finding your Dutch roots. But if it's their parents or their parents, why is there this idea that you must really be Dutch? And what is being really Dutch uh, to practice folk magic, you know? I mean, there's a lot of people in this country who barely have any heritage here, who uh, just arrived. Uh, for example, my aunt is from Ecuador, like the other side of the world. And she lived here for 14 years. She is Dutch to me. And in her head, she's also, she's Dutch, but she's also uh, from Ecuador. She's also, uh, she also says she's Brazilian because she lived a long time in Brazil. There is this thing that people can only be and only practice certain things because of their bloodline. And I think that's like, like I said, a very slippery slope to very problematic theories. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I think um, a lot of Germans are very hesitant to like let Americans into their space. And I'm lucky that I think my uh, German accent and the way that I phrase things in English is strong enough that people realize that I'm not really an American, that I am a German. So I don't get like any malicious comments of what are you doing in our space? Who are you to talk about this? But um, I see a lot of my uh, mutuals, which are from the US, kind of get swatted by tons of comments of angry Germans being like just assholes. And I think to like any um, any diaspora person like listening to us that's trying to connect back to European roots, you're not going to be enough for some people no matter what you do. Like um, I have- You can do all the research in the world, but yes. if you say you're American, you'll be excluded. Yeah. yeah. I have this mutual, um, uh, she goes by uh, Brauherei on TikTok yeah. and uh, mm -hmm. she, <laughs> She's basically, she's done every humanly possible thing to uh, be like accepted into the culture. She, um, she uh, have, and her family's originally German and moved to the US. She moved back to Germany. She speaks German. She speaks, I think, two German dialects. She has done a lot of research on German folk magic, is very respectful about it and engages with the people here that practice that stuff. And she's still got a lot of like angry German comments and I just, I get so annoyed when I see my fellow Germans or fellow Europeans being like complete assholes for like no reason at all to like Americans who are trying to reconnect back. I mean, sometimes yeah. annoyed reactions are warranted, especially when we are talk about stuff like what the Oglagen movement is doing, but sometimes you just gotta let people like be and like don't get on your high horse. Yeah, there's this notion of like uh, who deserves and who has the right to practice a certain country's folk magic. And I see a lot of people in my comments, I think it's she's called Crystal Keeper on TikTok. I'm not sure. But, um, or Jesse Mor Morinson. 
I'm not sure, difficult names, but um, they are very interested. They do a lot of research like Brauerei also does. And a lot of Dutch people in my comments are like, oh my God, we have folk magic. How did I not know this? Do they have more of a right to suddenly start practicing it? They'll probably be appropriating their own culture <laughs> very soon, like doing things that they don't understand just because it's their God-given right, their bloodline right to practice it. Even though the people who are outside the country and do a lot of research, um, they are closer to the practice than those Dutch people might ever be. But they will still be excluded. I think that's also a thing like, because it's online, so many people get to give their opinions and no one can just let other people live. Yeah. And it's really, sometimes it's really hard to scroll. Like sometimes I see videos of like uh, Dutch folklore creatures and everything. And uh, at one point I saw a girl who made songs for uh, Dutch goddesses. And she said like, uh, I didn't know about the goddess Eostra and I didn't know she had such a big role in Dutch folk magic. And I was like, I, I had to keep myself from commenting like Eostra, like there's very little uh, evidence of her. Like there's one quote from Bede and, and, and that's it. And I wanted to comment all of that. And I was like, you know what? This makes her happy. So why would sh she'll find out? Yeah. If she's really interested in Yostra, she'll Google and she'll find out. She'll get there. It's yeah. fine. I'm going to scroll. Like, you don't have to bash everything and everyone and give your opinion on everything. You can also just look at what pe makes people happy and just be like, okay, this is not my problem. I'm just going to, I'm just going to go away, you know, <laughs> but online, that's a thing that is not really people don't do that people won't ever do that online because they can hide you don't have to show your face online so you can hide and just bash other people and i think that uh that is really a problem with uh like the hate comments that Brauerei gets uh that they can hide in anonymous accounts and just be like oh you're not a real german blah, 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 blah. Mm. even though they don't know each other uh, they don't know uh, what kind of effort she has put in. Uh, they don't know anything about their lives. They just look at the video and assume, and that's kind of sad. I kind of don't know how um, you could maybe mend that situation. I mean, there are also a lot of people who um, expect us creators, especially who talk about these practices, to kind of spoon feed them the information um, to um, talk about another mutual of ours, a hearth witch. Uh, she oh. um, recently posted on, I think it was Twitter, um, a lot of screenshots from one of her videos. Um, and, and in that video, she talked about like regional German folk magic. And all of the comments were like, my family is originally from this town. What region would that be? And it's just like, Google Maps, bro. Just Google Maps. That, but also, like, they expect you to know everything. Yeah. And I, I do appreciate their interest, and I do appreciate that they want to learn. But, like, when you have a very specific practice, it's like being a heart surgeon and someone comes to you, it's like, he has a broken foot. I'm like, no, I'm a heart surgeon. I know about hearts. I don't know about bones and feet, you know? <laughs> There, there's this thing that they just expect you to know, like, uh, oh, I am from uh, West Vlaanderen. Vlaanderen, Belgium, was also a part of the Netherlands once. You must know a lot of folklore from there. And I'm like, no, and I, I don't. <laughs> I just don't. Yeah, but why not? You're a Dutch folk witch. I, I'm sorry. <laughs> I, I can't know everything. And to this day, I don't know how to exactly respond to these types of comments. I just decided to ignore them. Yeah, like, yeah. they don't know that I read them. <laughs> <laughs> That's probably for the best. Uh, I, I started to get them on my YouTube as well recently with, uh, like, I think it was somewhere, um, again, with Southwestern Germany where someone asked me that. And I, I don't know what to say to that. Like, I'm not the um, right person to ask for, ask for that. And the <laughs> thing is, I even put in my bio, like, Northwestern Germany and Silesia. Like these are the things that I know most about. And still people are like, 
But what about Bavarian folk magic? Like, I don't know. Um, yeah, like we do this because we think it's a fun subject, but I'm not like an expert or professor or, or a, a professional researcher on this subject. It's just one of my hyper-focused hobbies. Like, <laughs> to Again, to people listening, don't be that person. Uh, <laughs> like, just, I mean, if you ask respectfully and stuff like that, uh, that's a completely different situation. But like, um, if you, I think I can speak for both of us when I say that if you want to get into folk magic, you have to put in your own work at the end of the day. Yeah, I do. I do think that it's a sweet question if they ask for sources, because like, like I said, Dutch folk magic is very hard to find sources on. So I do think like, that's one of the questions that you can get away with, with me. Like, do you have any sources? I'm like, yes, here are all the sources. <laughs> you go. <laughs> Good luck. <laughs> I also am um, like, kind of curious to know, uh, since Dutch folk magic and German folk magic are like, so similar in so many ways, I have wondered that you guys also probably have a lot of um, like animist kind of uh, thought process when you uh, talk about like folk magic when you go about practicing it like for example maybe um, talking to a plant to kind of tell it what to do and stuff like that and uh, since uh, that kind of working with the land itself is uh, such a big part um, how has moving around the Netherlands kind of impacted your practice? Yeah, I think um, there's this thing like a lot of pagans say like you do, uh, you want to connect to your roots so you do the practice of your ancestors. The problem with me is that my ancestors are from Frisia and then they are from Zealand, which is in the south and then they're from also in the middle and um, like that's a lot of practices. So I just kind of uh, do, do them all. <laughs> but um, like I said, like um, when I started, uh, I lived in, uh, I lived close to Rotterdam. So you have a lot of uh, water, a lot of harbors, a lot of uh, parks, but not really forests, you know. So you have to work what you have. So you have to work with uh, like the weeds that grow near the shore and you have to work with the water. Then I moved to uh, Harlem and that is just a city with a park. So you don't, <laughs> once again, you don't really have anything in nature. You have the parks, but you don't really have like the real raw nature that you have where I live now, which is the Veluwe, which is like a big national park in the Netherlands. And uh, there are a lot of rules in Dutch folk magic on how to um, pluck specific plants and uh, what to say to them. You can't be wearing any shoes. You have to uh, not use tools, uh, that sort of stuff. So uh, I am not really familiar with a lot of animism. Like the way I started my practice was like kind of all over the place. So I haven't really been able to get into the animism side yet. So I am not sure about any other aspects that come back in Dutch folk magic, but uh, I think that a lot of it is really connecting with nature. And there's also this thing that you think that folk magic has to be like the old spells and the old stuff, but folk magic will also just be the things that the folk do, that the folk do. So that's also just the things that you come up with. Um, the things that you decide are uh, useful in your practice, uh, the, the, the nature that surrounds you at this moment. Like if they had uh, certain trees or certain plants that they used to have uh, in this country, but they're not here anymore, you can say like, oh, that's true folk magic, but true folk magic is also using the new plants and the new uh, species of plants that weren't really prevalent when they um, wrote those spells. You know, it's also, you can also have a modern folk practice. Yeah, I think a big part of folk magic is just doing the best with, with what you got, basically. Yes, that, that's what I wanted to say. <laughs> yeah. So um, uh, when it comes to like uh, animism, I can really recommend uh, the YouTube channel Nordic Animism. Uh, the creator that uh, 
has that channel is Danish, um, but he talks about also like um, Germanic kind of regions, not just like Southern Scandinavia, but he also sometimes mentions um, Northern Germany, the Alpine regions, and oh. uh, also I think he mentioned Frisia also. Yeah, there was a lot of trade, I think, uh, in the olden days between uh, Denmark and Frisia, so they're yeah. pretty connected too. Yeah. He either talks in his videos about that or in his book. I don't, I've forgotten, but <laughs> yeah, we we around like the southern Scandinavia, Netherlands, northern Germany. We are kind of like this one unit in a sense. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, yeah, so that might also uh, apply to you or to anyone else who's watching, and. Um, what he also talks about is like uh, folkloric land spirits and how they kind of show up in um, people's practice. And I think that's something that we can kind of both relate to. I mean, at least I work with the land spirits that I have around me and uh, I uh, let local folklore inform how I interact with these spirits and what I can kind of expect to find here in the spirit realm. And as you said, when you were at a place where there's a lot of like um, water and like a sea kind of region, I would imagine that there's different folklore and different land spirits when compared to where you live now, where it's a bit more foresty. So am I right in that? Yeah, yeah. There's uh, one writer in the Netherlands. He's called Abe, Abe the Verteller. It, it, that's kind of his title. It's like uh, Ape the Storyteller. And he has a website and he uh, compiled all of the folkloric creatures of the entire Netherlands and I think also Flanders. Um, and he wrote uh, beneath the descriptions, he wrote where they could be found. So there is definitely a difference between the spirits and the creatures that could be found uh, near water or in my town specifically. And um, in the forest, especially in Veluwe, there's a lot of folklore and a lot of uh, Witte Vive uh, folklore, a lot of uh, what we call opwippers, uh, probably best translated to jumpers, like creatures that jump on your back when you walk through the forest and weigh you down so that you, um, so that you collapse. But there's also, uh, actually, I think... That creature, uh, that folklore is pretty close to me. Um, the, the the creature called Blue Gerrit, Blaue Gerrit, and uh, he's also a jumper, but he like he is a helpful jumper. So at one point there was folklore that at one point uh, someone, a, a girl, was being kidnapped, and he weighed down the kidnapper so she had time to escape. Mm. So. Yeah, there's really specific creatures per region. And I think that's pretty cool. Like, shout out to uh, Abe the Storyteller, Abba the Forteller, uh, that he compiled that list because he um, went through so many books of regional folklore because they do exist at the end of the day. Uh, he went through all of them and like wrote down the entire list and it's so long. <laughs> yeah, it's insane, but it's, it's really good. Do you have like... Um where you live now a specific spirit or like a plant or place in nature where you're like this is my ride or die this is my home girl this is what I work with all the time or are you like more uh, indoors focused in your practice I am both outdoors and indoor focused I do have a spot uh, in the forest like a uh, five minutes right uh, bike ride from my house I do have a specific spot, which is like a big circle of um, what do you call those trees? The evergreens. Mm -hmm. And then there's one big, I think it's an oak, like right in the middle of that circle. And I just found that spot one day when I was like looking underneath the trees and I was like, oh, wait, that's like an empty spot there and if i sit there no one can see me from the outside that's my now you know <laughs> so uh that's that's kind of my 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 little spot that i um do a lot of uh meditating in and connecting with nature and uh listening to the forest which sounds really uh like floaty and and, and, and new agey but um it's really calming there you know and I do have one creature that is like 
my ride or die <laughs> that I absolutely love. And um, that is the Bitebao. Uh, he is, uh, according to some folklore, he's like a version of the devil, but like the, the folk magic -y devil, like not the big guy with the horns, but like uh, the one that you see in a lot of folklore. And uh, he is uh, scary to everyone. Like he appears like as a dog, I think, to most people, except when you're uh, when you're born with like the um, a membrane over your head. I think it's a birth on call that it's called. Uh, when you're born with like a certain membrane or a piece of tissue over your head, um, we call it. Uh, geboren met de helm, born with a helmet. But if you're born like that, um, it appears to you not like a dog, but as a helpful spirit, and it can help you in your practice. And yeah, that's like my favorite creature, personally. I was oh. personally I also had uh, a bird like that, like with the tissue over my head. So um, I would be someone who could contact that creature. I haven't done it yet. I, I'm too big of a pussy, but <laughs> that kind of reminds me of like um, uh, I think it's uh, like Scandinavian folklore. Uh, they have this concept called filgia, which is kind of a spiritual yeah. being that follows the person throughout their life, which is pretty interesting to kind of see these connections. Yeah, and um, I uh, I live in um, northwestern Germany, as I've already said, and pretty close to the Dutch border like I take longer from my home to travel to university than to travel to the Dutch border <laughs> so our folklore is probably really similar so I kind of um, really like to see like how we see the same stuff in the landscape for example and interpret it in similar ways especially since like we are both regions that are very like low lying with lots of um, uh, bogs, rivers, swamps like that. So we have a lot of like swamp folklore. And I feel like whenever I research German folklore specifically, it centers more around mountain regions, which I cannot relate to. Like the highest mountain that we have in my region is maybe 230 meters high. Oh, <laughs> yeah, same in the Netherlands. Like, we yeah, have yeah. a hill that we call a mountain. So, <laughs> yeah. Uh, I But we do get a lot of Dutch visitors in the summer that come from, like, Twente that kind of mountain bike around that hill because I guess that's just easier than going to, like, the southern Netherlands. or the other. Yeah. <laughs> um, But anyways, when uh, I research German folklore, a lot of the folklore will center around mountain regions in central and southern Germany. So uh, when I see Dutch folklore, I kind of relate more to that in a sense. Or, yeah, um, there's a lot of swamp and a lot of water here. So <laughs> yeah. yeah. Or also like um, southern Scandinavia, which has a similar landscape and climate as we do. And I just feel like it's so interesting to kind of see these cross country cross-cultural connections between uh, like in quotes Germanic people yeah it kind of like, shows how arbitrary those borders are you know yeah. because the south of the Netherlands and north of the Netherlands are completely different but if you just cross the border in the north of the Netherlands to Germany it's way more similar so yeah, yeah. in the end like those borders are man-made you know <laughs> the thing is um I uh when I talk Low Saxon, I can also kind of sort of better understand Dutch speakers when they talk, uh, since we have, um, since Low Saxon also didn't go through like the sound changes that happened in German. So our language is like older. And also there are Low Saxon speakers in the Netherlands. And uh, there's just like this Netherlands Germany border in between the Low Saxon speaking areas. But yeah, I feel like that's also important to know for people who aren't from these regions like the diaspora that we have talked about we kind of realize that these borders in a lot of cases aren't that old and even if they are they aren't necessarily good indicators for where a culture ends and where another one begins 
yeah that cultures aren't like these these uh, separate jam jars that don't mix <laughs> and just exist separately from each other yeah it's kind of more like a venn diagram <laughs> yeah yeah that's a good way to put it so i think we've worked through all of the questions that i had for you mm -hmm. um, we talked about regional folk magic culture diaspora and uh, german dutch relations so i think uh well to kind of uh, end things off i'm going to give uh, you the opportunity if you want uh to say anything, to bring anything back up, to ask anything, or to just shout anything into the void, uh, or the opportunity to like do so. <laughs> uh, yeah, okay. Uh, so, first of all, shout out to myself, follow me on TikTok, your local Aruna. <laughs> oh, that's awful. Um, <laughs> uh, just, I want to say to the Americans who want to connect, like, if you're willing to put in the work like you go for it don't let any grumpy european stop you because we will always be grumpy <laughs> that's never gonna change so just go for it just ignore us and just like learn everything that you possibly can um and to europeans like i understand that you want to protect yourself and your culture but also like be a bit more kind to people <laughs> like mm, yeah, I don't know. Just try to help them instead of just bashing them immediately, especially if they know more about your own culture than you. Shame on you. <laughs> and then, um, yeah, that's kind of all I wanted to say. Just be nice and, <laughs> and follow me on TikTok. That's my two things. <laughs> yeah. I Thank you so much. Message. Thank you so much for this interview, by the way. I just wanted to also shout that out into the void thank you so much i love your content um your youtube content but also like your tiktok content that's why we became mutuals in the first place because i'm very picky about who i follow because i feel like i always have to watch every single video so i really like your content so no, that's thank you so much. i want to say <laughs> and uh i think i've already told you this but you were the inspiration for me to start tiktok so really yes so you're kind of responsible for everything Aww. that is like come out I'm responsible for that. Oh, that's yeah. awesome. <laughs> oh, that's really cool. <laughs> so uh, with that said, all of the links uh, will be in the description down below, all of your local Aruna's links, my links, <laughs> uh, stuff that we've talked about that I find interesting to include. Um, so go look at that and I'll see you guys in the next one. Lordy what cook one. <laughs>